Welcome to World Ensemble Day. Uh, this is two workshops that celebrate a long history of innovative response to challenges that our programs face. And we will invent some of our own new responses today. Uh, if you can put an answer in the chat box to introduce yourself, you'll see, let's uh, re-enter it for those who have just arrived. But here's how our session will go. It's going to be pretty lively and busy, just to let you know. Uh, we're going to move along quickly. We're going to have some polls. We're going to have jam boards. And if you don't know what a jam board is, don't worry, we'll instruct. We're going to have breakout groups in both sessions. And we have facilitators who are halfway ready to make a smooth uh, uh, workshop in the, in the breakout room. Uh, the uh, technology may be a little, a little uncertain sometimes because we're innovating ourselves, but let's see what we can do. Uh, as you know, we have gathered a gallery of videos from programs around the world that celebrate new innovations that they have been have come up with to challenges in their programs. And our first workshop will focus particularly on that. So to begin, if I could invite our colleague, Ian Saunders uh, from the Longy School of Music. Longy is the publisher of the World Ensemble and the Ensemble. And Ian is the Assistant Dean of Artistic and Social Change. And he's here to give us an official welcome. Hello, hello. It's good to be in the space with everyone. Thank you, Eric, by the way. That was great, wonderful hype, man. I am thrilled to be here with everyone. So this is a wonderful place. Why? Because here we are in this virtual space filled with brilliant individuals who are eager and anxious to solve problems, right? So that, first and foremost, is going to be a very exciting thing. And so we're being led by two wonderful individuals, Eric and Trisha, who are great at doing that, who have always been a great resource for the field, uh, as well as the Ward Ensemble as well. So welcome again. You're in the right place to figure out solutions to a lot of these complex situations, especially with something when we're talking about social change, moving from that gesture to the actual actions that could benefit our programs and ultimately benefit our students as well. So thank you for being here. I think it's going to be really exciting, and I can't wait to work with everyone. Thank you, Ian. Uh, let's find out who's in the room. Elisabetta, can you give us our first poll? And yeah. we'll get a little sense of who's here. So it tells us we have mostly teachers. We've got a one blessed student that might be Excel. And we got four administrators in the room. OK, thank you for our, our first sense. And we are teacher dominant in this group. Uh, let's do a quick warm up if we can, since we're going to get used to a fast pace. And for those who have their screens off, it'd be great if you could put your video on, because I'm going to ask people to take their fingertips to the exact edge of their screen and see if they can touch the fingertip of the person in the next screen. Can you get fingertip to fingertip? Uh, because if we're good, we should have lines of fingertips, even though we're in different places, we have different people in front of us. Are you exactly fingertip with the person next to you? Line it up as exactly as possible. And then can we lift? It's not beautiful, but it's trying. Can we drop slowly together? Keep those fingertips if you can. Can we switch to top and bottom? And can we have vertical lines where fingertips are touching? It ain't pretty, but we're working on it. All right, good, shake it out. Uh, and I'm gonna put in a little practice 
uh, a little practice innovation challenge into the chat box. And would you put in the first good solution you can think of? All right, it's coming in just a moment. Here's the challenge. Students leave snack wrappers on the floor. Can you type in an innovative way to address that challenge? We're getting our creative ideas warmed up. Sing it. We, every time you see a rapper on the floor, you sing to it. We create a collage out of it to celebrate it. All right, Mariana's got us making rhythmic music with paper crackling, with rapper crackling. And the idea is to change the habits of mind of the students so they stop dropping rappers. Yeah. So the idea is we find a playful or new way to draw special attention to the problem to create a new habit of mind. In this case, the habit of mind of not dropping wrappers. Okay, Marshall's got a geographic solution. And the thinking you're doing just now, that's the space we're gonna be in for this chunk of time sort of suspending the usual rules and seeing what else might work. What else could we take a chance? So we're thinking about the innovation as individuals and innovation as programs. Elisabetta, can you give us these next three polls that invite us to do a little bit of thinking about how innovation currently lives within the programs that you work in? So we're going to have three in a row. How innovative are the practices in music or social change or Sistema programs in general? This is compared to more traditional youth music programs. How innovative are we? So the results suggest that we're pretty innovative. Our sense is that we are fairly innovative as a field. We're either somewhat innovative or very innovative. There's only one person who thinks we are the ultimate in innovativeness. So we still have a little room for growth today. Uh, let's take poll three. Right. Why do you think music for change or Sistema programs are not more innovative? And you can give more than one answer here. What are the reasons that limit our innovativeness? Money and time. I expected those to be the first answers. The universal truths, money and time. We're getting a little bit of agreement around caution, fear. A little sense of traditionalism. Nobody thinks we have no urgency to innovate. All right. So, Time and money, those are our main answers. I bet no one is surprised here. That is what inhibits our innovation with a little bit about caution and a little bit about traditionalism holding us back. Uh, let's take a look at our final poll. What is your personal experience of being inside innovative experiments? and you only get one answer on this one. How do you feel about being inside innovation? And we will recognize this is a self-selecting group. This is the group that chose to give up a chunk of their day to think about innovation. All right, so we've got a little bit of caution, but mostly we have a lot of agreement that experimentation is fantastic. And that's the group you wanna have on a day you're thinking about experimentation. Uh, before we start into our actual work of the morning, I want to invite the executive editor of the World Ensemble, Patrick Scafidi. I asked Patrick to 
just introduce the newsletter to everyone on the chance that you may not have thought about it enough and on the chance that it will encourage you to send more information to the newsletter so we can cover you. Patrick. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Eric, for the intro. I hope everyone's having a good day so far. Uh, as Eric said, I am the executive editor of the World Ensemble, founded by Eric and Trisha Tunstall, who are both with us today. Um, and I want to start with a short story, which is my introduction to El Sistema. Uh, when I was hired by our publisher, the Longy School of Music of Bard College, I had no connection to El Sistema. Uh, I came in as an editor only with no idea what he was walking into. And back then I thought, you know, it's simple. It's music for social change. You know, how big can this be? Um, as you all know, I couldn't have been more wrong because what I witnessed in just those first few months changed everything. Stories pouring in from every continent, from big programs and small programs. I saw how giant the movement is, how amazing the work being done is to improve communities. And best of all, I saw how much those people doing the work wanted to share with each other. Um, it was completely inspiring for me. And I say that story because that's really what the World Ensemble is about. Uh, our goal is to connect all of you, you know, ideally funders and then program leaders, teaching artists, students, everyone in the field, uh, and we do it by sharing your stories and your learning. You know, about half of our contributors are first time published writers, over half of our contributors are people of color, uh, and these writers come from all over, a music program on Easter Island, music students on a road trip in Mexico, Mozambique's Minister of Culture, uh, and you too, we hope. As you'll see today, no idea is too small to share, and when we share, everyone benefits. So I'm going to put my email in the chat here. And uh, please don't be shy about reaching out with a topic, a suggestion, even a hello. Um, there are only a few of us working on the World Ensemble, but thousands of you, and really your hellos are how the newsletters get made. Um, and not just teacher hellos, but students too. We have a World Ensemble ambassador cohort of 10 to 15 amazing young musicians across the world. Each month they share with our readers, you know, an interesting rehearsal, their favorite piece of music, something that's been bothering them lately. Um, and I bring them up now because we'll be recruiting new ambassadors beginning this September. So please, please encourage your students to apply because without their voices, we're missing half of the picture. Um, anyway, I know everyone's ready to dive back in. So I'm going to leave you all with uh, links to our most recent issue, the July issue, um, as well as our new website, EnsembleNews.org, um, and I hope the articles you see expand your work in new ways, in fun ways, in challenging ways, um, and I hope you all have a great World Ensemble Day. So thanks, everybody, for your time, and don't be afraid to reach out to us with your stories. Thank you, Patrick. That sounds like a new tagline we should add. Have a great World Ensemble Day. Uh, that we should all greet each other that way. And you mentioned the ambassadors. Um, Axel Miel is with us today. She's going to be the facilitator of one of the breakout groups, and she is the manager of the ambassadors program. So we have a student who grew up in a program in the Philippines, is now in college in the U.S., and manages the ambassador program of other students to which all of you are going to recommend uh, new ambassadors when we uh, invite that later this uh, fall. Uh, we're gonna do a little warm up activity now to get us thinking about innovations and how they work and how they might adapt. I'm in a moment, I'm gonna ask Elisabetta to play one of the videos that we collected. This comes from the Keys to Success program in Newark, New Jersey. And as you watch, and then right after, would you answer this question? I put in the chat box, what are the benefits of the Pen Pal program? You're going to see this little video they created, like the dozens of others that are on the website, and see if you can listen with a kind of carefulness that will let you answer the question, what are the benefits of this innovation of theirs. Keys to Success is a program that strives to remove systemic barriers to music education within the most areas of Newark, New Jersey by bringing music lessons at no cost to students. 
Recently, Keys to Success teamed up with Union County Vocational Technical High School, or UCVTS, to organize a pen pal program between Keys to Success's music students and UCVTS high schoolers. To say that the program was successful is an understatement. High schoolers and Keys to Success students alike expressed their excitement to receive letters and send them to a buddy, leading to an online game day in which pen pals were able to meet and play Roblox together. The program allowed for students to forge connections with peers and new people during a time that presented this as a rarity. Not only were Keys to Success kids able to express themselves in an alternate medium to the music they already studied with Keys to Success, but high schoolers were able to revisit a seemingly dying form of communication, letter writing, in an age where emails and text messages are more common. Additionally, Keys to Success added several UCVTS students to their growing team of high school volunteers. Keys to Success looks forward to working with UCVTS and other local high schools in the future to foster more connections between students and encourage collaboration. Okay, can you type into the chat box some of the benefits of their pen pal program. What did it accomplish? Increased contact for the kids who felt isolated during the pandemic. Connection with older students because they're high school, younger people with high schoolers. So there was a mentoring quality. They got to learn about those other kids they connected to. Uh, Sam, you're direct messaging me. So you might wanna Change that answer to connect to everyone. There we go. Excitement at new friends, new connections. Feeling listened to and watched. There were some other benefits mentioned. What else did you find? Inspiration and aspirations. Yep. Yep. Younger kids heard and admired by older kids. Talking and writing about music. Right, a different kind of work. And in fact, they mentioned using letters, an old fashioned form. It worked on the language art skills of those younger kids and the high school kids. I also heard them mention that they got new volunteers in their program, that some of those high schoolers actually began to work in the program. Connecting people when they couldn't do it in person, discovering a personal connection to someone new at a time when they really needed it. Beautiful. Um, clearly, you get a sense of the richness in what seems like a little program. You know, a kind of a modest experiment is rich with uh, innovative growth in areas the program needed. Uh, the, the dozens of videos that we were submitted, each one has that kind of richness in it. And in fact, innovation is one of the characteristics of the music for social change field. Um, I asked Trisha Tunstall, the co-founder of the World Ensemble, if she would give us a little history of our field through the lens of innovation. And she put together a couple of minute introduction to our gigantic history through that particular lens. Hi, Tricia. Hi, thanks, Eric, and hi, everybody. And uh, Elisabetta, if you can cue up my little PowerPoint, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, as Eric said, we are an innovative driven, innovation driven field, and we always, always have been. Um, it's a lot of you will know. Uh, so I just kind of put together a little montage of innovations that we have seen through our decade plus of researching and writing about El Sistema uh, in Venezuela and in the States and around the world. I'm going to take you through these. This is by no means exhaustive, but just to sort of spark your memory about things that have been innovative or your curiosity about things you haven't heard of before to just to get us in the sort of innovative fast lane that we're going to be in for the rest of this session. So um, next slide. So uh, the initial challenge in Venezuela in 1975 was, as you know, the 
grew, they started very small, but they grew very fast. And by the time they were up to hundreds of thousands of children, they definitely had this major challenge. So next slide. A lot of you know what they did about this, but some of you may not have. This was the paper orchestra, and that's Yosbel Spulce, who a master teacher who invented this idea of children, little kids, making their instruments out of paper mache and then decorating them sometimes and painting them and learning things about holding their instruments through them. This became such an enormous success that we kind of forgot that it was an innovation to a problem because kids enjoyed it so much. Uh, but it was an amazing way to have kids start to learn to love an instrument, hold, know how to hold it, know how to hug it, know how to use, and then learn to use proper, post, proper posture while playing it. So brilliant and far-reaching innovation. Next slide. You will all, many of you will know how Venezuela solved this major challenge too, because their uh, mandate for inclusivity really um, didn't allow them to look away from this challenge. So they looked right at it. Next slide. Um, so, okay, so the next slide would show you the White Hands Choir. Most of you are familiar with this, have seen it uh, maybe in your own programs or all the way across the world. It's that, it's the innovation in which um, young children who are singing, able to sing and able to hear, sing songs and the children with the white gloves are deaf or hard of hearing and they are, exper they are experiencing the song through their hands. And anybody who's ever seen it will know how moving it is. Anybody who hasn't ever seen it should definitely see it. But it was uh, it was born as an innovation to uh, something necessary, a challenge that was necessary to solve. Next slide. Okay, so this was the um, this is the Center for Social Action in the middle of Caracas. It's the flagship of El System in Venezuela. Uh, went up in the early 2000s, and as it was being built, Maestro Obreu, who was masterminding everything, foresaw a big, a small problem that he thought was big enough to need to solve. And that problem was, next slide, that um, after, when you, when, if you are holding an instrument and a music stand, as many kids would do, would be doing while they were running around the halls between the rehearsal rooms and the, on the, uh, performance rooms of this beautiful building, they would often be trying to open a door in this situation. So major challenge or minor challenge, but he was determined to solve it. And here's the solution that he came up with. It's a special doorknob you back into, you just press it with your back. We saw those all over the center and we were really impressed to know that that challenge was a challenge that Maestro Abreu thought it was important enough to address himself. Uh, Let's go on. Next slide. In uh, as uh, El Sistema spread throughout Latin, Amer Latin America in the 80s and 90s, there were uh, many, many places where the one of the biggest challenges was that there was still no rehearsal hall because there was actually no building to hold the program in. So there were many innovative challenges. Next slide will show you one of them. There you go. We saw lots of rehearsals and programs in that were learning their music together exactly in this situation. And if it rained, you came back the next day. Next slide. Guadalajara, Mexico, not enough teachers for all the children. This wasn't only in Guadalajara, this, is an, this was also endemic to the spread of Sistema throughout Latin America. And the solution to this is, again, something that you all know as a main feature of Sistema program programming and you've probably done it yourself, but that is to put kids in multi-age orchestras where there was lots of peer and mentor learning. So just to remind you, this isn't something that we do only because it's a wonderful thing for kids, but it was in the first place, a solution to a challenge. And then when everyone realized how great it was uh, between children, for the learner, for the teacher, for everyone involved, then it became a feature for programs that didn't even need to use it, but used it because it was so pointed at many of our goals. Next slide. Uh, just a quick through, a quick swing through the rest of the world. Uh, another major challenge as it spread throughout the world was uh, programs began asking themselves how we could open ways for youth to lead and you are all experiencing that now for sure and finding innovations for it. Here's one, next slide, in, in Harmony Lambeth, 
they began to let students become conductors to encourage them to support them in becoming conductors. Yeah. And I know you all do that a lot now, but that is again, and sprang from the need to innovate. In Soma, Japan, Sistema was facing a very different kind of challenge, and that was to help ch children deal from trauma. The reason El Sistema went to Japan was that a tsunami, the tsunami in 2011 left hundreds and hundreds of kids on the coast of Japan homeless, many fit without family members, and they were definitely clearly traumatized and the elders of the town of Soma decided that the best thing for them was music and joy and they brought an El Sistema program to town. And here's one way that program dealt with helping children heal. They formed multi-generational orchestras, uh, not profession, the older people in this slide are not professionals, sometimes they're grandfathers or aunts or uncles. They just put everyone in together of any age in orchestras and all of them taught one another, uh, learned from one another and provided, most importantly, a keen sense of belonging and family for those kids who needed it so much. Next slide, another challenge in Rwanda. There were no music teachers in this community and a, a, a clinic that was dealing with young people who were living with HIV decided that what uh, that what these kids really needed was musical activity uh, on a daily basis, but they didn't have anyone in the community who could teach it. So they teamed up with an extraordinary uh, organization called Musicians Without Borders, who visited Rwanda. And next slide. They taught family members and clinic and clinic aides, clinic uh, personnel basic musical skills, sort of rudimentary skills, so that the people who were already there in the community had enough skill to work with these young people in ways that were so desperately needed. That's a brilliant and simple innovation that we don't think of enough. So now we're up to date. This is my last challenge, and this is uh, fairly recent, that in Srebrenica, Bosnia, the SuperR program has found in the, in the last two or three years, I would say, that students got, were really getting distracted and distressed by the amount of political turmoil and divisiveness in the country. The, there were all sorts of challenges to elections and um, other unheard of things. And uh, they, it, it was intense enough and in their part of the country, um, strong enough and compelling enough that it was uh, really affecting their ability to learn their music. So what they decided to do, I think, is an extraordinary innovation. They decided to devote 44% of their time to group learning about democratic process and community engagement. This, they sent recently published this pie chart to show exactly how they were allocating the time for their students. And you'll see that 56% of, of the students' time is still spent on music learning. But the other large, almost half, 44%, is spent on 25% uh, education, and that really re refers to a civic, a civic, a curriculum about civics and the democratic process, so that their kids could be really clear about what a democracy really is and what civic engagement really meant. And then the other large percentages of their time, volunteerism and community, the kids, they really encourage the kids on program time to move out into their communities and do what they can environmentally, socially, to help their communities be healthier, more stable, and even more civically responsible. Um, that's a whirlwind tour through innovation, uh, 1975 to now. There were many more that I couldn't include. But it sort of sparks your, hopefully, can spark your own ideas about meeting very demanding challenges and always coming up with fabulous innovations. So your, your turn. Thank you, Tricia. So we have a history of innovation. And now I want to take a look at an, a specific innovation that's a little more complex than the one we looked at before with the Pen Pal program. This comes from New Zealand. But to get some notes from you to actually boost your thinking, we want to introduce the technique of a Jamboard. And Elisabetta, if you can put that Jamboard link, I'm going to invite people to go to the Jamboard before we look at the video and just get used to how you use a Jamboard. So if everyone can click on that link, it will take you to 
a Google product called the Jamboard. And I will give you just a brief update on how to use a Jamboard. And we're gonna be looking at an innovation in Sistema Wangarei from New Zealand. And if you can see it, there's a label on this Jamboard. What are the challenges Wangarei is addressing and how does this innovation work? And we're gonna add our answers to that question on this Jamboard. If you look down the left-hand side of the screen, if you click on the fourth icon down, it's called a sticky note. Click on that. And it's like a post-it note that you put on a whiteboard and you can type into it and then hit save and it appears on the Jamboard, on the Jamboard. Give it a test, try out, right, you got it. And you can try different colors. You can put in different words, oh nice. Yeah, we're getting it now. You can see it's pretty easy. And after the video, you're gonna type in what challenges Wangarai was addressing and any thoughts about how it works. And here's one more Jamboard issue. If you look at the very top, you'll see a rectangle with a one slash two. That says there's two pages to this Jamboard. Click on the arrow to the right and it'll take you to a new Jamboard where you put up different answers for how might their innovation be useful for your program, your teaching, your learning. This is where we practice adapting someone else's innovation. How might it work in my program? So you would put in an answer here too that answers that question. And so we will gather responses for both. Uh, do we have questions about how to use the Jamboard? Some people may have trouble uh, if they're on a phone. If you want to type in an answer into the chat box, we'll bring it over to the Jamboard. Uh, any quest Jamboard questions? All right, we got lucky. And here's how we're going to do it. Uh, we're going to watch the video submitted by Sam Winterton uh, from Sistema Wangarai about their arts-based research project. Listen carefully. Then we're going to answer those two questions on the Jamboard. And then we get to talk to Sam a little bit. So, Elisabetta, if you can play their video for us. Kia ora everyone, my name is Sam Winterton from Sistema Whangarei in New Zealand. We were very lucky to come across something called arts-based research while we were looking for a way to inquire into how our young people felt about our program and how we could keep them engaged. This arts-based inquiry, this process, uses our art form to help us see what it is that we need to know about our young people and you can use this also for a personal inquiry. I wasn't sure what we were going to find but what we have found was quite extraordinary not only through the process with our young people on a two-day workshop in January 2020 where we saw them really discover a whole lot of stuff about themselves right there but we also saw the effects going through lockdown for us in March, April, May 2020 through to this year to 2021. We have seen so much growth from our young people and I attribute a large portion of that to, to our inquiry. It released us to um, allow our young people to have a whole lot more freedom 
and to develop a whole amount of empowerment. There's a lot more to say, and one day I will. For us, now we just need to keep working on it and keep it going, so I'll be looking for advice from all of you guys. Kakiti. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Thank you. So head over to the Jamboard and see what you can come up with. What challenges was Fangarai addressing? And whatever sense you have of how this innovation works, give us a post-it note of your thoughts. Lack of student motivation, my goodness, it's universal that we want more. Did you have any sense of how arts-based research actually worked, like how they did it? Yeah, Sam identified what the young people need using a musical kind of tool to discover the needs of their young people during the, a difficult time. Yeah, we're seeing a lot that it was addressing motivation. And I know that's an issue in every program. Uh, you might want to think on the second jam board, how might this have application to your program or your teaching or your learning about your students? Any thoughts to post there? Well, you are going to get a chance to know more about arts-based research in just a minute. Yeah. We all need to learn more about the needs of students. They tend to be compliant and generous. What can they tell us and how can we surface their needs? And this innovation is how can we surface it through musical exploration? How do we discover the individuality of them and not just their being part of a successful ensemble? These are the right questions. And arts-based research answers it in an innovative way. I'll give you just another minute to add a few more post-it notes. Uh, feel free to keep adding uh, to the Jamboard as I invite Sam, it's well after midnight in Whangarei, uh, New Zealand, and Sam is with us. And can you tell us a little bit about this tool of arts-based research? How does it work? Uh, hi. Well, it would be great if it was just a very um, sort of clear sort of description. But basically, um, it's... For us, we set a, um, a challenge, I suppose, if you like, for, for our young people to create um, an improvised piece and um, that was based on their, who they saw the best um, sort of version of themselves um, as a future learner. I, that I'm not describing it very well. Um, how we did that was um, through a whole lot of scaffolding in, in both directions. So conversations about what it is to be a learner in Systema, what they you know what they get from it, what's what's important for them, um, sort of characteristics, as it were, for being a learner um, of in music and, and a Sistema program, and then also some scaffolding for actually how to do the improvisation. Um, so um, that that's really how, how it was for us. Um, I understand that um, arts-based research is actually a, a very big and broad field that I can't pretend to know a whole, you know, all of it about. We just were lucky to come across across it as something that we could um, work on with our young people. 
um, it was important for us, of course, to make sure that we had agreement from the young people. And to be clear, um, arts-based research is, is something that's used for, um, for therapy. And we were not claiming to be um, psychologists or therapists or anything in that, in that realm at all. But what we were able to do was give the young people freedom um, and support to experiment um, together in their, in their um, small groups, um, but also in some larger settings where they were able to be almost individual in, in, in their experimentation. And um, so what we, what we saw was um, giving our young people that freedom and support at the same time um, is what seemed to make them brave and um, open them up to be able to really create. Uh, Sam, uh, um, in a moment, I'm gonna invite people who have questions for you to ask. Uh, one, two things I wanna note. Number one is note that you committed a, a two day retreat you actually, that's a big commitment of young people's time and organizational time mm. to make an investigation of the individual needs and motivations of kids. In and of itself, that's something for us to note. And I wanted to ask how you learned about it so that you all could find your way through it. Um, gosh, I learned about it because I, we were really looking for ways to really find out um, what our young people needed. So we would find that we'd have um, young people in the program, they would be very happy, they'd be enthusiastic, they'd be amazing, you know, really engaged, and then they were not there. Then they'd gone. And we could see that there was a big hole in our understanding of, of um, what actually they needed in our space you know the idea of what we thought they needed and what they really needed was a different match um and so so we were searching and one day i was scrolling facebook and somebody was talking about um being a researcher and i jumped straight in there and said look have you got some ideas for us i was lucky enough for this person to work at um, Whitecliffe College um, as she um, is a lecturer for um, arts therapy. And we had a few calls and, and some conversations and she guided us through that process um, remotely. Um, to this day, we haven't actually met yep. in person, but <laughs> um, she, she was a, right. uh, she was a great support for us, um, yeah. Interesting to note. So an idea, an, uh, a, a challenge was noted, a little blip of an idea appeared on Facebook, a connection to uh, someone yeah. with uh, knowledge and authority, and then without even meeting in person, launching a two day experiment. Uh, do any <laughs> of our participants have <laughs> questions? Anyone have questions for Sam? Uh, you may not be able to get into the details of arts-based research, but anything that would be helpful to you, you're curious about? If so, unmute to speak up. Sam, we may not have questions for you. That's all, that's all good. It's quite confusing, really. <laughs> I had a question but it actually. Was Excel. Yeah, I was curious to um, find out what were your findings after the two day retreat? Um, again, what would have been really nice was a whole sort of list of things. Um, but what emerged um, was understanding the need for, uh, for freedom but at the same time for our young people to be really clear that they, they're secure, that, that, um, that they're safe when they, when they um, 
step out and um, take on a challenge. And also for our young people to be clear about what their next step is and what, um, what they have power to change. So from that, we have created um, kind of a, a curriculum is the best word I can come up with that we call the framework for inter interdependent learning. And that framework has um, the sort of steps for technique for their instruments and, and um, technique for playing in orchestra. Um, it has got steps, goals for musicianship and also goals for the affective curriculum. So the affective curriculum being, being able to ask questions, for example, um, being able to um, self-regulate, so um, maintain a calm body, being able to use their imagination to solve a problem, lots of um, things like that. And so now using that, um, that framework, we can share that with our young people. Um, we share it during session, we share it on, on our Google Classroom. So each group um, is invited into Google Classroom and, and those things are shared there. We, we still have a long, 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 long way to go um, to really make sure that those, um, that those goals are up are really clear for our young people. But what we see is that our young people are now, um, particularly the teenagers, are prepared to ask for what they want. Um, they're, they're doing ridiculous things like, um, just recently, some of the students were taken to a concert because we're, we're quite a long way from any big city. So, um, they were taken to a concert in the big city um, and our national orchestra was playing there. So all these professional musicians and our young people went and asked for lessons from them and they got lessons there and then. It's like, it's crazy. I would have never done anything like that as a teenager. I couldn't even, <laughs> couldn't even imagine it. Um, and so, you know, these guys are asking, the younger ones are, are asking, can I go to this orchestra? Can I do that thing? And and we we try not to say no, we just we try and work work with what what it is they like to do as long as it's going to fit for them. So I think what we found a lot is what is how our response needed to change, is what how what we needed to do more than anything else. Yeah. Beautiful, Sam. Thank you. Uh, what a what an eloquent example of one experiment that leads to an entire rethinking of programmatic offering, a new curriculum, let's call it, and already significant results in exactly the direction they were hoping for. Sam, thank you for staying up so late for us, and you're very we're going to move on to our next section. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Everyone, I might please go give to Sam now. a hand. <laughs> Thanks. Good night, everybody. Uh, good night, Sam. Elisabetta, we're about to head into breakout groups, and you're going to give us a little explanation of technology. Yeah, of course, here I am. So what is going to happen now is that I will divide you in five, I think, breakout rooms. And in each room, you will have a facilitator that will help you with your task. And your task is precisely in a Google Doc that I will share in each room. So maybe you will have to be patient because I want to be in each room for like one minute, share the, uh, the document, and then I will go to another room. So maybe you have to wait two minutes like this. And last but not least, if you have any issues, technical issues, you will have in your room a button like with a question mark. And if you push that button, I will suddenly appear in your room and help if you need. Okay? So I will open- Beautiful, thank you. 
when you uh, talk just before you send everyone off your facilitator will have you introduce yourselves quickly and then you're going to go look at a bunch of videos quickly and pick one that interests you study it together and bring back your insights for the rest of us okay leave it to your facilitator and off we go So I think what, what they do is that the the student um, films themselves practicing, right? And then they sh yeah. um, send that out into like the whole world basically. And then they ask for funds and then that's how they raise money. The one bit I'm not quite getting. Oh, sorry, sorry, carry on. Sorry, no. Oh, yeah, the, the only part I wasn't getting, so it sounds like they, they film the video of themselves practicing for however long they want to. And then they show that to family members or wider community to be sponsored. I don't know if then there's a, like, oh, if you sponsor me, I'll practice more. Have pazienza. Tranquilo. I don't mind just going with what Ricardo likes. I, 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 okay. I'm, okay. It, wow. it seems a bit easier if we do that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Okay. So I'm see you going. in the main room. Bye. Welcome back. And how did it, how was the technology? If you had problems, go like this. If you had no problems, go like this. We have the middle, we have good. Fairly good. We have, Eliz we have Elisabetta to thank you. Bravo, Elisabetta, uh, thank you. Uh, bravo, Elisabetta. Bravo, so, Elisabetta. Uh, we are going to take a break in a minute and two things before our break. When we come back, we will ask each of these five groups to share their best ideas from studying one video. So we'll have time for each group to share their discoveries. I hope you are ready. You have uh, the Google Doc for notes. Also, if by chance, when you were watching the videos, you thought, I wish I made a video. I have some good ideas, but I didn't get to share them. We will give you a chance to have 30 seconds to share an innovation of your own. So if on the break, you would like to prepare a 30 second description of an innovation of yours or one you know about. We will have time for anybody who wants to share a 30 second idea they didn't have a chance to share before. Are there questions from anybody? Shout out if you have a question. It looks like no questions. All right, that means you have a half hour. We will start right at the top of the hour. You have a half hour for coffee, bathroom, stretch. Remember you're a human and not just a rectangular box. And when we come back in the second half, we will do something different. We will start to innovate new ideas for program challenges ourselves. So we will come up with new innovations. So see you all back here in a half hour. So this is a small but mighty group and we maybe will change the agenda because there's not so many people. Uh, but let's start if we have someone from each group that can talk a little bit about the video you focused on in the first part. Uh, and we can ask questions, we can uh, investigate some of the ideas that you share. Uh, so is there a spokesperson from group one who was facilitator for group one? That was me and our spokesperson is YOLO. Yeah. 
Um, so we watched uh, the video from Keys to Success, the practice a fundraiser. Um, I just thought it was a, a really cool idea. So at, at first watch, I didn't quite catch what it was about, but um, it turned out it was about having the employees and musical volunteers of the project do a video of themselves practicing. And then the students then took those videos out to show to family members and to the wider community um, to get donations. Uh, and then this carried on over like a period of uh, a few weeks, I think. And then at the end of the month, I think there's a, all of the videos were put together into one, one long video and like showed along with the total amount raised. Um, thought it was a really cool idea because it, it hit at least two issues that I think a lot of our projects have, which is how do you get kids to practice and how do you raise funds? Um, so rather than having it be the, the musical volunteers and the employees doing videos, we thought of it more, uh, Taru brought up the idea of the UNICEF, uh, walk fund where the kids are sponsored per kilometer they walk. So then thinking of it in terms of a thing of like, okay, can, can you do that with like practice? Like, oh, if you sponsor me for like, and I will practice for X hours, um, across the month, like across the month. And then that would be a pretty cool way as, as well as us, the tutors, because then that gives you a nice little bit of, you know, demonstrating to the kids that, yeah, we practice too. And we are bad at our instruments too, you know, like, <laughs> it does take work. You're not just all excellent all the time. Um, yeah, I think, I think that was the. Yeah, I think that was most of it. Excel, yeah, did you have other thoughts as a recent student in a program? Yeah, I think uh, I, I hadn't heard of the practice-a-thon before, and I think it was a really cool idea. And something that we talked about in our breakout room was how it was weird that we didn't really see this idea more often um, in programs, because I think it's a really cool way to not only get kids to practice, but also to show the community and their friends what they're actually doing in the program. And I like um, Yolo's suggestion of taking it further and even asking the students to tell um, whoever they're showing the video to that if you donate more money, I'll practice more hours. Um, and he called it an actively sponsored practice, which is something like I think that's a really cool term to be able to use. Nice. Fantastic. I'm loving the image of the kids with two impulses. I want to raise the money, but then I have to practice more. Uh, we're going to make our kids crazy. It's a good one. <laughs> um, other thoughts? Does anyone have further thoughts about the notion of a fundraising a thon? Is there a way to engage community in a in an engagement way to raise money. Any other thoughts or experiences you've had? I could share one thought. Um, just this, I like the idea that it's really pushing the kids' idea of themselves and what they can accomplish. When I was growing up, when I was 14, I went to a music camp and we had a practice marathon day. And it was just this crazy, I remember distinctly setting this goal saying, I'm going to practice two hours today, which up until that point, even getting 30 minutes in, I thought was impossible. And just setting that goal and waking up. And then I did it from like nine to 12. And then the day was halfway over and I couldn't believe myself. So just speaking from <laughs> personal experience, this uh, could be very <laughs> boundary pushing for the kids. Right. Beautiful. I'm, I'm wondering if you could even have a practice-a-thon where a section has to keep the practice going for, let's say, eight hours, and one kid can pass it on to the next, to the next, to the next, and can they actually, the idea is make it a game to right. actually playfully engage. You had a thought, Tricia? I love the idea of making it a game. and. Uh... You could do that by by practicing the just sort of there. There's a hot potato, which is you're the practicer, and you do that, for, and then you practice, and then you hand it over. But you make sure that the practicing never stops for eight hours, or something like that. Fantastic. And the more, and then I don't know. You could make it into relay races <laughs> in some way. But if you could get a lot of kids involved in that and make it a game, it would be great. And like. 
um, like Bridget, kids find out that that they actually can do that. That's 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 a doable thing, which a lot of kids don't know. Uh, Tricia, you remind me of uh, the first time you and I were in Venezuela, and uh, we watched the orchestra uh, do do the D scale for twenty mm. minutes. Mm -hmm. Basically, the world's most boring activity, and it gamified it to the point that it was hilarious and energetic. You think we could do it this way? Oh, let's try it. Oh, that really fell apart. Could we do it this way? Could we do it fast? Could we do one half doing this, one half the other? To gamify the boring part in a genuine and practical way so it's innovative. Uh, let's move to group number two. Who was the facilitator yeah. of group number two? Uh, Lucy, can you share uh what you discovered from your video um yeah we chose the um one from japan um and um i think what we liked about it was the fact that um it was the whole symphony orchestra rehearsing but they were all they were then split up into little groups so you never had the whole violin section together or the whole cello section together they they could really um they could really hear their own parts whereas if you're one of many first violins you might not really be aware of exactly what you're playing and how you fit into the um ensemble um so we just thought it was great that they could the um, students can understand where they fit into the bigger picture of a symphony and um, they can hear what they're doing better um, and they're also uh, aware of the of what everyone else is doing so it's all developing their ensemble and um, uh, in the smaller groups they're also looking at each other more rather than just at the conductor so they're developing those uh, musical communication skills Mm hmm. Thank you. Uh, Tricia, was there anything else you noted in the video? Lucy put it really well. Uh, and I noticed that in the video when the kids, it's like the room breaks up to into a series of lots and lots of string, a string quartet. But they're all in little circles of one kind of instrument each so it's a series of all become doing nothing it wasn't even though they were all playing together maybe he gave them the downbeat and then they were all playing together his hands in us because kids were only looking at each other across their little circles they engaged and right. here each hearing as, as lucy said each hearing themselves better also each hearing what what the other parts of this piece actually were where their piece fit into it it was, it's a lovely, a really lovely innovation. And I think anyone who has a big a rehearsal hall big enough to do that, it would be a great thing to try. And uh, simple in terms of its introduction, it doesn't require a lot of explanation and forcing them into another kind of vulnerability, you know, a kind of transparency about their work rather than sinking into the section. Beautiful. Um, any yes. questions? Vulnerability, but also, it, sorry, I was just going to no, say go vulnerability. Yeah, but also agency. They were they were the only people, person in their group playing their part, and so it was very. It's a sense of power that they had. So, um, any questions or other ideas people have about disrupting the configuration of the orchestra rehearsal? I have a few. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, go ahead, because uh, we are we were going to say that we are group number five and actually we chose the same video. Uh, so then uh, actually then Bridget was chosen to be the spokesperson. So maybe if, I don't know, Bridget, if you want to add uh, other things that uh, were not mentioned before. Yeah, sure. Um, a few things. First of all, just thinking about how in a way the, the formation of the orchestra can be such a limitation. It's so dangerous to just get into the routine of practicing in the same formation every day. This I'm a classroom teacher. I teach string classes at a school. And actually just a few days ago, I was thinking how cool it would be to have three main formations, like frontwards orchestra, maybe pods and then rows. And just to have different formations in rotation that the kids each 
day, you know, you can just say easily, okay, today is pod formation. And then they know how to set themselves up. Um, because I think a lot of times it's just a matter of time management, like getting the kids to sit in a new way can take so much time, especially if they're younger. Um, we noticed in the video that the repertoire that they were working on, it was uh, Beethoven and it seemed pretty advanced. And we were kind of discussing that there's also a good potential, like how could you use this idea in the more beginning phases of a rehearsal? Um, you know, just getting them in those little groups and how perhaps with the right rooms one could divide up and have a few working groups. Um, also the idea of extra musical tasks for those groups for team building, um, you know, giving each, maybe labeling the, the little groups and giving them other tasks like uh, ones responsible for setup, cleanup, getting them more engaged in non-musical ways. And uh, we discussed, you know, in, in that video, they were mixed instrument groups and we had a lot of the same thoughts about how it gives agency. It maybe makes them, you know, I'm a violist, my main instrument. And I can imagine like, if I was in a formation like that, I'd probably be a little bit more active in the rehearsal and not just doing the viola thing of falling asleep and faking it, um, you know? And we, um, also thought of the point how nice it is that the conductor's there, but he's kind of playing a much different role. You know, he's in the middle still, but he's not the same center that he was before. Like he's still in the center, but there's other centers around him that are kind of more important. And it creates this multi-level circle formation that I think is kind of beautiful. Um, let me check my notes, make sure I didn't forget anything. Maybe I just can add one thing yes. um, that I actually noticed in the video that, that there were some students having uh, their back facing the conductor. Mm -hmm. And actually that called my attention and also made me think that it's actually a good way for students to be autonomous, not to be too dependent on the conductor that uh, eventually will give the gesture and then they will know then they, when they should start. So for that way they will know how to count uh, the bars that they need just to wait. Um, yeah, and actually, I found I found that um, yeah in, uh, important. So maybe don't know if you want to add anything else. I think that's everything. It's beautiful. Uh, I wanted to just mention this notion of disrupting the usual pattern of an orchestra to provoke fresh attention. Um, I do know orchestras that. Sometimes the conductor of the youth orchestra does the downbeat and then nothing. And it's uh, like the idea you were just sharing, Mariana, which is you, the orchestra is on its own to listen and find its way together. And I've known other orchestras where they turn their backs to one another. So they can't even visually connect with people in a small group. They're completely reliant on their hearing and it's almost like a challenge game. Can you stay together? Can you keep timing close enough if you don't even have the visual cues of one another? And these are all ways to provoke extra attending muscles. Uh, does anyone else have any other experiences of disrupting the configuration to speed learning? It's not really disrupting the configuration, but it was just something that occurred to me when you were talking. There's a professional orchestra called the Aurora Orchestra based in London, and they all perform without music, so they memorise their music. And that just is such an, another brilliant way to enable the communication that they're, they're not tied down to what's in front of them. They're really able to have the eye contact and see all the movement. Right, and so the challenge embedded in that is even for younger players, could we challenge them to learn a short piece and play without music enough that they can gain a new kind of mastery of it uh, through what they, they learn with their eyes off the page? Good challenge. Uh, what about group three? Who is leading group three? It appears it's me. <laughs> because I, I was in the room with uh, Barry and uh, Ricardo, and uh, at a certain point they were 
uh, not quite agreeing on uh, which video to um, pick because uh, I, I wouldn't say it's not quite agreeing it's the the translation thing more yeah than it was a language agreeing <laughs> let's say sort of so uh i don't know barry if you want to say something about your video first then i will say something for ricardo why did you pick that that one or okay um the the one we i looked at was the um the win music community uh, uh charter school in washington high um where the musicians and teaching artists um co-plan lessons with the subject leaders uh, of other subjects so maths uh science literacy and there's a big a common three a theme a thread through every subject and I think that's wonderful. It's great that that hope in the hope that the children then and the students then will learn and be able to just use whatever skill they've learnt in the music, in ensemble playing, um, building resilience in practice, and and build those skills in those subjects as well. Um, as an aside, it's quite interesting that we're trying to develop this in um, nationally in Wales that uh the the links between um the arts and different subjects uh, are made stronger um just to help the children and learners to 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 realize that just because you learn one thing in one subject it doesn't mean it's irrelevant in another and this is what i really loved about that particular project beautiful i will just add uh that's particular school for those of you who haven't watched the video w h i n is their experiment, is they are the answer to the question, what would Sistema look like if it were a whole school? So they use the same foundational principles of El Sistema, but it extends to every subject and the colleagues in different subject areas speak the way music to music colleagues would speak. It's a very interesting experiment uh, there's one other school in the US that does this that is a high school, and I will put the link to that in the chat box because it's a really interesting school too called Renaissance Arts Academy. Elisabetta, can you speak for the other video? Yeah, of course. So Ricardo told me that he loved in particular uh, the video of El Sistema Cyprus. Uh, I actually, I didn't watch that video, so I guess the, um, the reason was that uh, here he saw um, many young musicians and uh, there was a lot of peer teaching. And I didn't saw the video, but I know uh, the project that Ricardo is um, belongs to. And the project is called uh, Luca Orchestral Laboratory and it takes place in uh, in Italy, Luca. And they, um, they have a particular day and on that day, the uh, children and young people of uh, um, all nationality are invited to participate in the orchestra under the guidance of the teacher. So that is a, um, a moment for great musical integration, of course, but also social integration because they have um, lots of, um, he said, like, sorry, it's 50% of the children, of the children who make up the orchestra and they are foreigners. So there is a great exchange. And um, this is, uh, I think uh, he, uh, he was, uh, he, he he recognized in some way the same thing in the uh, musical activities by Sistema Cyprus. Uh, can I just uh, thank you so much? Can I just clarify? Oh, Hi. Yeah, <laughs> just to clarify something that I think it was not so clear from our videos. Yeah, of course our orchestra is uh, it has more than more than 50 percent or maybe around 90 percent of children with with migrant and refugee background but um the um, activity that we presented is uh with the our children were teaching to other children that are, do not participate in el sistema that they don't know maybe about el sistema but um the thing is that we were keep people were keeping inviting us to play to perform 
in so many festivals. And uh, we, it was not possible for us to all the time to arrange something like that. So we were trying to find another way to be able to participate uh, mm -hmm. and uh, also for the children to, for our children to be more, um, to have more interaction with other children. And because our children are, are usually in ghetto schools, they are not so mm -hmm. much into, into the, um, the Cypriot society. So in this way, our children were teaching to other children. Uh, so- Yeah, I think that this is the point that uh, Ricardo have wanted to highlight because it's the, the peer teaching thing that is always interesting. And I saw in uh, his orchestra. So I, I think that's the point. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you both. So it's it's an innovation for integration of social integration in a playful child led way. Beautiful idea. Uh, do we have uh, someone from group four? It's us. Uh, That's you, yes. Yeah, but uh, we also chose Japan's. <laughs> Okay. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I think it's something that we will all try, <laughs> I <laughs> guess, <laughs> after we, we go back to rehearsals. Um, uh, yeah. Nicoletta, uh, you're making me think we must write an article in the World Ensemble about the work in Cyprus and the work in Soma, Japan, uh, <laughs> because those ideas seem to have attracted people. Yeah, of course, of course, we have to. Um, yeah, I mean, you said pretty much uh, a lot of things. We, we also rec recognize that, you know, the ability when you are in a group to listen um, to your group and also to the other groups that you have uh, many, um, you have individuals with instruments and they also get um, a sense of uh, responsibility, um, which is something that we would, love to see in our programs more um maybe and um what else did we say elisa it was very fast and then i realized that when i was writing my notes i was writing my no notes in break in breakout room five <laughs> it's okay we got your notes elisa you are you. japan and yeah um i, I was was writing my notes in breakout room three so <laughs> it was I mean it was a complete failure but yeah we were discussing a lot about this uh, possibility of having a different perspective with this shape of the ensemble and the conductor in the in the middle of the different different small circles um, I also noted down that the other members of our of my group had also um, liked the video from Canada uh, Sistema, so the New Brun Brunswick, I think, and also yeah. um, the, the Finland video. And uh, we had watched also the Kenya video. So just some note, but yeah. It, it was also Beautiful. a lot ab about new tools for working in ensemble. Right. Also so, uh, people, for the Canada. Uh, these people can go watch those videos. You can go see them for yourself and take their ideas. I want to move us on a little bit now. Elisabetta is going to give us a new Jamboard link to do some thinking together about innovation in our programs. Uh, these are the questions. There'll be three Jamboards, and these are the questions. What can help teachers innovate effectively? You might want to think what makes it hard for them. How can we encourage support innovation by teachers? How can we help innovation by programs? And how can we help innovation by individual students? So we'll meet you over the board and see if we can come up with some ideas for ways to support innovation. Think how you might do this. How do you encourage teachers not to be afraid of failure? How do you do that? 
How do you create time and habits of reflection? How do you provide emotional support? Our pink post-it reminds us of what Sam Winterton showed of their innovation in New Zealand. Ideas about programs on the second page. How do you structure in more teamwork? We know, all know that's a good thing. How do we create a structure that prioritizes that? And in that sharing time, teachers can share their new ideas and create a culture of more innovation. I think during SEO, you will hear from Fiona Cunningham and the Academy for Impact in Music, which is all about innovation. And we have ideas on how students can be encouraged to develop innovative solutions. I love that first one word, ask students. How rarely we do that, how we rarely we say, students, what's a more interesting way we could accomplish this goal? What if that were a regular practice? Students, what can you do on your own before we come back together tomorrow that solves this problem? And challenge yourself to think, how do we create a climate of open-mindedness? What innovations can you introduce that changes the climate to make it more open-minded? Again, we saw a good example from New Zealand about how they did it. How can you do it? So as you're reading what your colleagues are putting together, think about the how of that for your own program. We're going to have uh, some breakout groups in a minute where you can start to think in detail about questions like this, getting down to the actual, how would we do this? And this suggestions say, maybe we should be adjusting time a little more for teachers to have time together, more for students to offer their innovative ideas for how to accomplish musical and social goals. Anybody noticing I'm other also, things? I'm Should noticing that on several, yes, on several of the boards, the idea appears that uh, it's essential that if you make mistakes, there are no negative consequences, nobody gets punished for it, that so that there's actually uh, you feel free to make a mistake. Teamwork, it says teamwork and not be afraid to make, make a mistake. In other words, there's freedom for that. There's, there's room and space to fail and try again. Yeah, you That's remind me, uh, I, a student of mine used to have the habit of celebrating the best mistake of the day. And he would pause at the end of a class and everyone would announce their mistakes and they'd pick which was the biggest mistake of the day and they would all cheer for it. That's great. Yep. Anybody else noticing things? These are really rich ideas. <clears throat> the challenge of course is in the how. We know where to innovate, but can we create the structures and the choices Notice Sam uh, from New Zealand, they created a two day special investigation to create their innovations and look at what they got. A whole new era of motivation for their students. Any, any further thoughts as you're reading through these? One thing that I noticed across all three boards was this need to ask for feedback or seek different perspectives 
So in the first board, we had involving students in like maybe um, curriculum making or um, thinking about what ideas we could implement in the classroom. And then in the second board, it was not just um, working within like your team, but then also going out, um, connecting with professionals outside the music scene with artists and other disciplines. And then in the third board, we also had, again, this um, concept of asking students what they want and giving them a more active role. I think that's something that I've seen um, across all boards. Yeah, and what a, what a good takeaway question for us today is how do we create dedicated occasions, not just casual occasions, but dedicated consistent opportunities to ask and listen hard to the answers and take those answers seriously so that it becomes a, um, a kind of habit of mind within the program that we ask and listen and respond to what we hear. Good observation, thank you, Axel. Any other observations? Um, following on from that, thinking that um, to um, get the students to feel that they're really at the center of it, that it's not something that's being done to them, but they're really part of, of making things happen and they're really part of the whole experience so that they feel the ownership of it rather than just something that, oh, we've got to do this now for the next half an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a sort of a trust building relationship with young people where over time they come to recognize we are really asking, we are really listening, and we are really responding uh, is an agency building empowerment for young people and there's a fair amount of research that would suggest that leads to greater motivation. When young people feel they have more ownership of the process, they invest themselves more. Any final observations about these Jamboards, which we will uh, save, Elisabetta, and make sure everyone can have access to, so we can, uh, we can reflect on them. Okay, uh, let's move to a real conversation that gets into the nitty gritty. Because we don't have quite as many participants as we anticipated, we're gonna adjust our strategy a little bit. And here's how it's gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna ask in a moment, Elisabetta will put up five possible topic areas where you could investigate new ideas with your colleagues. Right here and now, investigate, well, here's where we're stuck, and together just freely think what might be other solutions and jot them down to keep. Because we don't have so many people and we don't want to put you in a, break, a, a brainstorming group of one person or two persons, when we find not too many people have signed up for one topic, we're gonna move you into another topic so that you have you know, four people at least to think about these issues. So Elisabetta, if you can put our topics up, oh, there they are. You see student creative voice, community engagement and impact, building students musical ambition, developing student leadership, or engaging students with disabilities. In a moment, we're gonna ask you to choose to join one of those five. We are going to get into Sorry, just jumped in to be sure that you have your Google Doc. Do you have it? Uh, that's, a good, that's a good point, let me see. That's a good point, okay. So uh, can you please remind me the name? Oh, okay, community engagement. So I'm sending you the GDoc. Yeah, why don't you do that? So that you can take notes. All right. There you are. 
So I'll leave you and I go to, you, you can, you can follow the instruction here. And if you need me, you, you can just call me with the question mark button. Okay. Okay. That sounds See you great. Later. I just want to make sure that you have your Google doc. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'll leave you. Bye. 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 And yeah, that's me. Thank you, Bridget. Okay. Everybody's okay. Everybody's thinking, writing, and okay. Beautiful. But as I understand it, we've got this Google Doc, which has put down um, ways, you know, some questions here. Uh, identify several specific ways in which our programs limit impact and engagement with the local community. Then some minutes to start inventing some bold and original ways to get the thing going again. We need a documenter who's going to help to put the ideas into the Google Doc. I mean, the spokesperson to have a chat when they go back. I'm happy to moderate now. Anybody want to volunteer to write into the Google Doc? Don't all rush at once. Okay, thank you, Lucy. Star for you, great. And anybody, would anybody like to kind of talk about this when we get back as a spokesperson? I, I thought I saw Nicoletta putting her hand up there. No? No, no. I, you... Love to, love to. Okay. Excellent. Right. A beer for both of you when I next see you. Um, so I don't know how long we've got on this, probably only a few minutes, but I mean, you know, I, it's interesting to say this, you know, what are, what are the limits? What are the things that are the challenges about making real connection with communities and the engagement side, as far as you guys have, any of us finding anything? This, this is one of our problems we have up here. Um, we find that we think we're doing a really great job of getting to know the kids. And then we mention like, oh yeah, we're, we're teaching your kids in Kodyo Tor. And then some of the family members like, who? <laughs> so um, I think we get really focused into our little thing, uh, what we're doing. Okay, so uh, there's a kind of bubble. It's, yeah. uh, there's, a, there's, an, uh, there's not always a great skill at escaping the bubble. Mm. And so you don't even know, it's like that Donald Ronsfeld thing. You don't even know that you don't know who's out there. They don't know about you. Um, sorry to quote him, that's terrible. Um, any, anybody, okay, we've got 10 minutes here. Please have one to three innovative ideas. Taro, were you wanting to come in and? Uh, yes, actually we made the same kind of thing here in Finland, in, in Oulu. We, we organized this kind of campaign that we collected um, instruments and it was a huge success also. But the uh, other in, innovation, I, what we somewhere talked about earlier, but this parents orchestra was something that I was really, really, um, it really got my my uh, interest. And that is something uh, I've heard that in Vanta, in Finland, in Vanta, they uh, already started this kind of thing, that, but we need to try that also. But that's how we get engage with the parents also with the family and get them them active and um, uh, like uh, make their agency also yeah so it's it's like both of these things encourage participation by people outside of yes the group you're with uh, already yeah so this thing of yeah N nicoletta yeah I, I can i can also add this with the parents we have like a parents union yeah. And um, they take over many things. When when we don't have a sponsor for snacks, for example, they will call. They, they will donate money they, in 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 their group, and they will go to a house. They will prepare snacks, and they will come to the orchestra rehearsals, and they will distribute. And uh, they help also mm -hmm. with the communication with other parents and the kids. And whenever we need to, to support. Uh, a, a kid or a family because of uh, something uh, that happened they will also organize things this has been a brilliant so, uh, exercise i mean it's such thank you thank you marshall time. no no trisha thank you thank you for you coming with a good thing okay bye 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 breakout room we're about to be thrown bye out <laughs> welcome back thank you all uh you're getting very good at this and we have a little chance of time, maybe we end a little early today, to share your best ideas with the other group. This is a rare opportunity where we've been thinking about new ideas we can try, 
let's share our best ideas with one another. Can someone from the Community Engagement and Impact Group, I know Tricia, you were facilitating in there, uh, can that group share some of its favorite ideas? It's us, I will, I will speak. Um, okay, so uh, we have three, I think, main. Uh, the first is to give uh, a participatory power to the community. Some ideas that we had um, experience in our programs is, for example, uh, that uh, in two countries we did instrument, uh, second-hand instrument campaign, and uh, we asked, for example, from the people who donated instruments to write a dedication to the, to the student that will receive the instrument. And uh, this uh, helped a lot with the community engagement because they would then come to watch all of our concerts to see the kids who play their instruments and everything. Um, and also the, to give, for example, to have um, a community of uh, friends of, of a program that are volunteers in a program that would uh, help and, and support in, in different sections. Mm -hmm. And also um, these all are part of the, uh, the first idea, which is the participatory power. And also, for example, with the parents, uh, either to have a parents orchestra uh, or to have a parents union that will help with many things that the program needs. Then we have uh, the, to have ideas of one-to-one uh, -one connections. Um, like I, I think it's the, the instrument idea, but also to, to have, uh, Marshall, do you want to, I'm, I'm a bit lost here now. I think it's the instruments idea. Well, I, yeah, I mean, we're also thinking of the beginning of the session when you talked about the pen pals. Yeah, so the, the pen question pals, was, okay, you know, yeah. where is there somebody you could reach out to in the community on a one to one basis to have a more immersive relationship and then that flowers. And I mean, one of the things we came up with was the idea that, you know, if you're at a certain level as a player, what if you ask players who are, I don't know, five, 10 years older, but not ancient in the music conservatoires? People who are students in the conservators, hey, will you be my teacher? Because then you give them stature, you give them kind of authority when they're in a learning situation still themselves. So it's ways of, but doing that on a one-to-one -one basis so that this is a really um, deep immersive thing. And I, I was inspired to that actually from the pen pal idea that you mentioned. Yep, and finally, for our programs to be there for the communities, not only the community, uh, want to be engaged in what we do, but also for us to be engaged in urgent needs that the community has, or to be part, to be participating and uh, providing support also to, to the needs of the community. Yeah, beautiful ideas. Uh, two quick responses, and then maybe we have questions from the other group. Um, I, when I am around uh, programs that are asking for donations of used instruments, I always ask that they send every few months a postcard from the instrument back to the person who gave it, describing how things have been going for the instrument. <laughs> so the instrument sustains the relationship with the person who gave it, and it has a playful feeling that makes for stronger connection. Uh, a beautiful idea and the notion of a parents orchestra. Uh, we've heard this uh, in a number of programs and this notion of responding to the community's need. I'm thinking of the international music and sports program that heard from its com community that there was a real starvation problem during the pandemic in their African communities and they began to dedicate a, a significant part of their funding and activity to actually providing food for the community. And that community and music program will have a new relationship forever. Uh, people from the other group, do you have questions for this group?
do you have examples of your own of innovative ways that community connection has been made? You're asking us or, or the other groups? Or, right, our innovative muscles are getting tired. The other group, uh, I think they're asking the other groups. I think Barry was telling us about- What's that? Barry was telling us about a project that they will yes. probably Let's do. Let's hear from the other group. Um, with the university, with the, the college. Um, yeah, we, we pre-COVID, we built up a, uh, some funding and a relationship with the Royal Welsh College of Music um, from the point of you have students can come up, come over who are initially uh, originally from our area and have gone to, to Cardiff to study music and they were going to come back and perform for our children and kind of co-teach with us. So it's, it's a two way thing. They'll learn from us um, how, how we work with our children and also we we'll, the, the children will be inspired by them. And we do. We're going to do a little concert and 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 bring the parents in, the 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 carers or any any member of brothers and sisters, all all all, all the usual stuff for, for a community per, um, performance. Um, so that's the plan, um, or was the plan a year and a half ago. So it will be the plan, hopefully from September. So that's a, a little idea that's um, sprung up, and we took took advantage of that situation. Are there other ideas from that group uh, about building musical ambition? Yes, um, I could uh, share the other ideas that we had the other two. It's, it's interesting, the more we think about this problem, it's actually more complex than meets the eye, right? You'd think that it would just be about uh, giving them harder music or whatever, but some interesting ideas came up. One point was um, making sure that the admin and the teachers in your program are not drifted too far apart because that team needs to be unified in order for the students to be ambitious. Um, so that we talked about that a lot. And one idea that just came to my mind, which we didn't talk about yet, was having the teachers and the students maybe give the admin a lot on an instrument that aren't, you know, if the admin's not so musical. Am I frozen here? Uh oh. Bridget, Other am, I still, in that group. am I still here? <laughs> yeah, oh, you're, no. you're okay, back now in. we're back. back in. Just come back. What, what's the last thing we heard? I. Uh, you were talking about the um, the admin and the teachers being taught by the students. Yes, just to have a, a lesson like that, to bring that closer together. And the other point we discussed was just agency again, how student agency can increase motivation. And the idea came up to have a student repertoire selection committee for your program. So to have a small group of you know, however many want to or whatever you want, and, and to have them actually set, not just pick the pieces, but look at the repertoire and set learning goals about the pieces. So, and then the third idea was uh, the one to make collaborations with music schools and more advanced institutions. And another point about that I think is important is that you make it a real, you know, you have to make sure this, that the kids are getting credit or whatever. I did this when I was studying at the Eastman School in Rochester. I had to go into schools and, and help, but it, you know, not to say I wouldn't have done it if it was only volunteer, but I needed those credits for my music education degree. I needed observation hours. So having a system set up like that where, like, sorry, but college students are usually pretty busy and, and you know, without that, sometimes you need to put structures in place that um, make accountability a thing, so. Yeah, boy, I want to be in the room of that student committee that is arguing about the repertoire they yeah. should propose I'm the program. <laughs> I want to be in that room. <laughs> uh, are are there questions from the other group for this group? 
thinking about student ambition. I guess not. I don't have a question, but I had a thought that occurred um, whilst I was listening. Um, so I think in general with ambition, the, they need to feel that they're succeeding right from the start, because if they're always doing something that is maybe a bit too difficult or that they feel like they're always struggling, if maybe you're, you need to set them up for success right from the beginning and then they'll feel encouraged to, oh, I can do that. I'm going to try the next thing. I'm going to get better. I'm going to do the next thing and the next thing. Um, yeah, so I just think setting them up for success right from the start. Lucy, I've heard of some. I'm back. Uh, I've heard of some programs that have children go back to a piece they played a while before, and rediscover how well they play it now, and you know push their the quality of their work, because they're returning to something they have mastery of, and they now can recognize how much better they can play this now, as a way to build up their confidence rather than always challenging on the edge of what they can barely do. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts about building student ambition? I think one thing is absolutely turning on its head that kind of the, well, what I think of as the European thing, which is uh, fear of failure. You know, and this is obviously a great thing we have from the Venezuelans, which is actually encourage, encourage people to be comfortable with failure. In fact, the more the merrier, the better. You talked about that a bit earlier. And I think what I've noticed is one of the biggest kind of lids on ambition is fear, well, if I try it, I might fail. So, so creating the culture of, of acceptable failure lots of the time, I think is, is a good thing. And I, 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 yeah, that, that was kind of one thing. Um, yeah. And just so to quit, throw one last very brief thing in was, I think Fiona Cunningham, when she was at Sustainer England, had this fantastic, started this amazing young leaders program. And they were back again to the same thing, which is you give the students some power and they'll give you back success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so a good question, since it's come up throughout our day together for a takeaway thought is, how do we build a culture that risks failure? How do we build, open up the climate of our programs so that it's okay to fail in fact, failure is going to be part of the way things always happen. Uh, the how of that, we know it in the abstract, but for your program, what is the how of that? A good takeaway. We're, we're near the end of our time. Are there some other takeaway thoughts? We may end a little early, which is good, but are there other takeaway thoughts? People either write in the chat box if there's a thought that sticks with you, if there's uh, an actual specific idea you want to try, would you either put it in the chat box or be brave and unmute and share one takeaway thought? If I may, the um, orchestra um, improvisation explorers uh, one of the videos uh, that was on, on the website, on the Ensemble uh, News website. I think that's great. There's no such thing as a mistake. Um, and that's one thing that I'd like to, when, when our children are back on their instruments, at the moment they're not, um, when our children are back on the instruments, I'd like to try and uh, experiment with that and, and do some improvisation with there's no such thing as mistakes at the forefront and maybe even create some challenges where people are gonna screw up and make it fun. Make it what high ambition and screwing up becomes part of the fun of pushing it. Other thoughts, either in the chat box or out loud. I see Marshall maybe is waiting to speak. Yeah, sorry, I, I was just gonna say, Eric, you were asking about how do you make the culture of acceptable failure in an organization and i think it's the opposite you know a lot of what we do with el sistema work is is we we say it's from the ground up it's bottom up 
But actually making failure acceptable, I think is top down, which is to say the bosses and those in charge and those teaching have to show that they fail. They have to advertise their comfort with failing. Um, Eric, it's something you're very good at. Often when you do a talk, you begin by saying something self-deprecating about yourself. And that's an advert to say, guys, it's fine to actually be vulnerable and talk about your failure. And I really think it's important in an organization that there's top down permission for that. All right, so that's a takeaway for everyone. Thank you, Marshall, of how you go back to work and fail immediately first day back. Big public catastrophe. And if you let us know, we will celebrate the best mistake made by this group, the biggest catastrophe possible. We will cheer you on. Thank you, Marshall. And I would say that it brings us back to the theme of innovation, because I think you absolutely can't have good innovation unless you have, you know, tries that don't work. And it's, I think it's essential to, to building a culture of innovation that you have that permission for failure. Beautiful. And I think the other, thing, the other idea that I wanted to uh, contribute as a, one, as a lasting takeaway was that idea we got from one of the jam boards about how important it is to actually plan into our schedules time. Yeah, Trisha and I are sharing a video link, and so we both get slow at the same time. Uh, that's why I keep shutting off my video. Uh, Trisha, we got you about the importance of actually scheduling in those time priorities. Uh, it appeared across the Jamboard, and if we just make an assumption, it doesn't happen. Uh, I would suggest we are done. Right. Uh, and that I would want to end with thanks for hanging in there through a long uh, morning or afternoon of processing idea after idea after idea, moving along quickly. In the chat box, you'll see ways you can reach us. Uh, the World Ensemble is looking to write articles about innovations. Contact the uh, website or the executive editor, and we'll be right on it. Uh, we will keep a, a, a link for the Jamboards. I see that Elisabetta has put it in the in the chat box. Yeah, I, I, I put in your... the chat in the chat box the results. So they are a PDF file. But if you want to write all over again on the Jamboard, you can do it. You have the the links. So fantastic. You can. Uh, so I think this is the moment for all of us to wave goodbye and say thank you to everybody for being here. Good luck attending the rest of your SEO events and we'll see you along the way. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.